to you today about power sexuality and the feminist narrative and how it relates to how I learned to drive. One of the reasons that uh, I think these discussions are important is because uh, being at an academic institution, I think it's really important that we elevate the discourse about theater. Theater is, is a craft by its nature and it's important that, that we address it as such. Um, and also this play in particular because of the, the nature of the play and, and the, the issues that it raises, I think it's important that we initiate a public dialogue about what's going on to, to not only understand the play, but also because I think this, this, this is a play that warrants dialogue. Um, it raises uh, important, complicated, sometimes frustrating, uh, sometimes disturbing emotions. And, and so one of the things that, that my dissertation argues and, and my research work in, in general is theater can be useful. It can start conversations. It's, it's a place to, to be effective, open dialogues, initiate empathy, and, and start a healing process, which, which is hopefully something that we're, we're at least trying to do uh, with how I learned to drive. So we're going to start off with uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, we're going we're to talk about feminism a little bit. Then we're going to move into some more clinical analysis of, of what, the, what the play presents. And, but we want, we want this to be a dialogue. We want this to be a discussion. So we may veer off and, and interject each other and interrupt each other. Uh, and if you have questions at any time, please, please feel free to ask. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to, to Anne. Great. And um, I, I have a couple uh, familiar faces out here. Um, some people from my, my course, uh, Rebel, Rebels in uh, Film and Literature. So I'm really happy that they're here tonight. Um, we get to discuss this for, you know, two hours or whatever um, on Tuesday. Um, we're just going to tell you things. But the first question I wanted to ask is, we have fem feminist narratives, you know, blown up here um, in the backdrop. But I wanted to ask you first, and I already, you know, cherry picked some people from the audience to, to get started thinking about this question: is, you know, what is feminism to you? I mean, we all have so we have so many preconceived notions about what that term is, and I think um, mainstream media often distorts the definition of what that is, and we have a lot of sort of stereotypes about feminism. So I just wanted to. Um, ask you all what, what you think that definition, what, what the definition of feminism is um, in your eyes. I think in, I guess, very broad, general strokes, um, it's, I view it as supporting and when we need to stand up for equality specifically with women. Okay. In mind. Okay. I kind of look at it as So in some ways you're saying that there's a, a kind of tension between 
sort of popular, almost stereotypical negative representations of feminism as being kind of radical and um, almost or in some ways violent or, or and then the, the positive one that you that the positive definition is is just kind of a basic notion of equality between men and women. Okay. I, I think there's a, with most things it's a spectrum. There's okay. gonna be radicals on both ends. Okay. And a lot of times radicals like no matter what end it is can be seen as negative or can be negative and the middle is seen or is and a lot of times, the, opinion. The, the ends of the spectrum get sensationalized and, put, yes. and, put, and, and also misinterpreted. Type, a lot of times, misinterpreted and right. just kind of they become, we, we sort of, we like things easy, right? In pop culture, right? We want to, yeah. you know, sort of dilute everything. And um, But that's a really good point. Um, I think it's, it's definitely the woman's right to choose. I think that's what feminism is about, is choosing about making decisions about her world and having control over her own destiny, whether or not she wants to stay at home, if she wants to stay home and raise the kids. As long as she's had that choice, as long as she's allowed to make that decision for herself, then that's, that's the feminine. If she wants to go out and work and not have kids, that's her choice. I think it's important that she has control over her own life. And that, I think that's a, did you want to add something? Okay. You're good? Okay. <laughs> you thought you were at the edge of your seat. I thought maybe you needed to. Um, thank you so much for, you know, sticking your neck out there and um, sharing some of those definitions. And um, I think they're really, it's really useful to have a, sort of a, an idea of where you're all coming at. Um, and, you know, I think that feminist narrative, what I'm talking about today, is, is really how maybe those choices are represented. Okay, that that so so imagining a context in which women have are allowed choices, right? Um, and also shedding light on the ways in which women's choices are constrained, right? Um, and I, for me, uh, I think that Jackie's point really is central to really understanding this play. Really, um, and so what I'm going to do is kind of get into the teacher mode a little bit, and I have a PowerPoint slide uh, in which I, I, I kind of uh, list some what I think are, are sort of defining features of feminist literature, um, and I've also included a, a basic definition of feminism uh, here. And uh, so the way I define feminism, and everyone defines I think feminism very differently, is really it's it's a political movement committed to ending gender oppression. And, and you know, as an English professor um, and a women's studies professor, what I'm really interested in is, is looking at the sort of literary and artistic piece of that political movement. And you know, like Tom, I'm interested in, in how narratives are, can be really charged with ethical purposes and political purposes, right? Um, and so for me, the way I define feminist literature is this, um, literature that uh, and literature encompasses poetry, fiction, and drama, um, but uh, it's that something that renders visible the structures and institutions that promote gender inequality. Okay, um, so the workforce, for example, right? Um, even to this day, we have a huge discrepancy, a wage discrepancy between what men and women are, are paid, for instance, right? Um, renders visible, uh, so feminist literature also renders visible strategies for empowerment and healing in an oppressive societal context. So in this case, we're thinking about empowerment and healing um, in, in, term, in, in relation to sexual violence against women. Um, and when and we, um, I think if any of you were at the vagina monologues, you know the statistics there are, are pretty dramatic, right, in terms of the kind of imbalance between um, male and female, uh, sort of the, the, the degree to which women are more often right, victims of sexual violence than men. Not that men aren't victims of sexual violence as well, but um, so another, the, 
most important feature, I think, of um, feminism from a literary standpoint is, is this idea of the uh, king um, complicating the master narratives that promote limited or oppressive conceptions of gender, um, or really challenging maybe a narrative or way of thinking about the world that doesn't permit choice, right? Um, to kind of come back to Jackie's great uh, definition there. Um, so, so for me, these, these are really three defining features of, uh, of feminist narrative. And what I, what I want to put up here is, is to kind of give you all an idea of what I mean by narrative, or, and, and specifically a master narrative, okay, is, is I, we have a familiar tale here. How many people remember, read, or saw the Disney version or whatever, or some version of uh, Little Red Riding Hood? Um, okay, so it's a, it's a classic fairy tale, right? Um, and, but it's more than just a fairy tale. Um, I would call this a master narrative uh, that in many ways gives us a very limited conception of what it means to be a woman and what a, 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 a woman's life encompasses or what it, um, and so specifically we have this little tale of uh, Little Red Riding Hood and she, does anybody remember the story? What happens? I have a remind some reminders here. Um, mom's house, she's at mom's house and she gets sent to go to grandma's house and she goes into the forest and what happens? Do you remember? She meets a big bad wolf. She meets a big bad wolf, right? Um, and she's on her way to Graham's house. And, and I think a lot of people don't think of this as this is a very symbolic narrative. It's, it's actually, it's a didactic allegory. Didactic just means it teaches us something. An allegory is just really another way of talking about the, the, what, what these uh, symbols sort of stand in for. So Little Red Riding Hood going into the forest that journey is very symbolic of uh, coming of age, right? Because Little Red Riding Hood's for the first time going off into the forest without her mom, right, by herself. And she goes into the forest and she is, is confronted with danger, which is what happens to all of us, right, when we leave mom and dad for the first time. And, um, but it's also uh, symbolic of adolescence, right? Um, Little Red Riding Hood goes into the forest and she's wearing a red coat. And what does what might red the red coat symbolize or stand in for? Sarah, you know this. Well, you you're not ruining it. But uh, what? Uh, kind of female. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say, I mean, not to get gross, but the red coat, what happens when women come of age, right? They get their periods, right? Um, the other way that people have interpreted the red coat is as it's, it's the broken hymen, right? She gets devoured by a wolf who stands in for sexuality. Um, so, you know, not to, I, I don't know, I've really kind of brought Little Red Riding Hood down to this, this whole new level for you here. But, um, but, but, you know, symbolically, what does that lesson teach us about female sexuality? Take a stab. They must be taken. They must be forced. They must be forced upon them. Yeah. They don't want sex. That's, there's so many, yeah, there's so, yeah, and it's, it's inherently fearful. It's inherently passive, right? What else? Scary, painful. Scary, painful. Well, that's dangerous to, you know. Good, yeah. Um, it's a cautionary tale. Don't go off by yourself because look what's going to happen to you. You're going to, you know. Um, and in many ways, this is a sensational narrative that we hear all the time as women. Don't leave your house, right? Um, you're going to get all these bad things are going to ha happen to you, right? Um, and it's it kind of gives us a very, very uh, one-dimensional idea of what it means to female sexuality is all about, right? Um, and there's also something disturbing about, uh, there's a kind of stupidity there, right, inherent in why is she wearing that red coat? It kind of makes me think of like, why was she wearing that, that dress and showing off her body, right, when she went to that bar, she's asking for it. So there's, there's sort of all these things that I think cling to this narrative, this, this allegory about female sexuality. And even though um, the play that we're gonna see tonight 
is all about female victimization in many ways, right? Sexual victimization. It really challenges all of those notions, those, 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 those sort of master notions of, of female sexuality that we've been told since we were little kids, right? Um, and that kind of take on many different forms in, in the popular culture. Um, so um, I'm speaking too much. But anyway, um, so what I, what I just want to um, suggest, what I feel is, is, is sort of happening in Vogel's, uh, what Vogel's depiction of coming of age is that she suggests some things about what it means to come of age as a woman, right? That, again, challenges this master narrative. Um, so she says that to become a woman in a patriarchal culture is a just stressful, shameful, and often violent experience. Well, that to me resonates a lot with the the Little Red Riding Hood story. But I think that it's it's very different from it in, in, a, in a couple different ways, right? We acknowledge that female victimization exists, that there is rampant sexual violence against women, but we can also think about womanhood and female agency and female choice in different ways, right? We allow for um, challenges to that narrative. Um, so she she also suggests, which I think is, 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 is often true, um, that women are positioned to adopt the social norms of a hierarchical culture that considers them right, um, inferior or subordinate. Um, and then um, at the same time, as I keep on saying over and over again, I sound like a, is that what really distinguishes Vogel's narrative, it, you know, from, from the big bad wolf, right, is that it renders visible strategies for empowerment and healing in an oppressive societal context. So even, even though there's still this victim, this narrative of victimization, the victim and victimizer binary is troubled, right? And this is something that I'm kind of, this is, I'm handing the time yeah, about this. I, I think this is a good segue into right. to Christine, actually, and uh, the gray areas that the, the play represents. Absolutely, and the, some of the things that you said sort of were making me think, wanting me, wanting to jump in. Um, you know, I think when I talked to a few people on Friday after they'd seen the Thursday night show about what they thought to, to kind of get their reactions and, and think about what I wanted to say today, and I think one of the things that's most important about um, the play is people get to see parts of a, a sexually abusive relationship um, that they're not used to seeing, or that some people aren't used to seeing, but people that don't work in professions like mine, um, especially, so they're confused by that. They're like, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand the relationship. I didn't understand um, the times when a little bit is flirtatious. And, and um, I'm, I'm just, just to provide some context a little bit, so for those of you that haven't seen the play or haven't read it yet, it's, right. um, there, there are peppered throughout the play is is a little bit the the protagonist, the, the narrator of the story. Um, the relationship between her and her, and her uncle, uh, she is often portrayed as being very com complicit in that relationship. She's she's flirtatious with him. She comes on to him a lot, and and particularly in, in, in uh, one scene in particular, it's. There has been a lot of pushback against that critically and as well as in the past couple of days where people just, that's a hard thing to see the apparent victim have agency in that, in that relationship. So that, just to give some, some right. context. But I think one of the important things about that is that so many women who are victims experience exactly those types of experiences and feel so much guilt and shame um, about being or about feeling like they had, um, they caused some of this to happen or they were partly responsible for these things to happen, it leads to a very, for many of them, a very long road of hiding um, and not, never wanting to talk about that shame and never wanting to talk about their part in what happened. We may know the, people may know the general story that this thing turned this, this woman was abused by, by this male, but then the, those parts of the story, the parts that I think are so important in this play, do get brought out, and it is confusing for people, but also very important, because I think until those parts of the story are told, I don't think the healing really fully happens. 
And I also think it's important to point out how the story is told, too. Mm. This, is, this is a memory play, so the play starts off with a little bit who is, uh, at, as the narrator, is 34 years old. And she's reflecting back on these periods throughout her life. And so we see her uh, from ages 11 through 18, and then her as narrator in her 30s. And up until her late teens, it, it's a very different representation of that relationship as opposed to how she's reflecting on it later in her life. So how the story is told is also really important as well. Very important. And so I think you'll see when you watch it and, and sort of pay attention to, sometimes it's um, made explicit what her age is, and sometimes you're just referencing the year. So in your mind, you need to be sort of, at least for me, when I watch I need to be have to do some math. in my totally mind math. how old she is at various times. And you can see developmentally her ability to sort of understand the relationship at that point in time and what parts of it um, are either are, are where she's fearful. You can see the, those parts when she's younger and she's unsure and confused. As she gets older, um, the parts, uh, and you and I were talking about this, where the parts that she feels are wrong is um, that she's betraying her aunt, that they're betraying her aunt, and that's the part that feels wrong to her. Um, it's, and it's not until later when, except that we see her in the, in the very beginning as a 35, 30, 30, almost 35, 30 year old woman who has become more empowered, more resilient. But I think it's important to understand how long it's taken her to sort of come to the place where she can tell the story in this way, right? And so you'll see that. You'll see her, her, her mood, everything about her change when, she, when she's going back and forth to different ages. But I think at the same time, that is confusing for some people, especially if they weren't tracking carefully her age. So, uh, oh, yes? Um, I just wanted to add to something that just that you were saying, um, I think some of the confusion often with sexual abuse victims comes from the fact that that it feels good at yeah. the time, and in addition to feeling good, then there's all these extra kind of things that they usually get. It could be money, it could be toys, it could be um, different things. So maybe it's easier to understand when you understand what she was getting from uh, complying or participating. Right, and, it, and it's a very special relationship, right? And that's not uncommon in, in sexual abuse. That is not an uncommon thing, especially when it's a family member, a relative, a friend. Um, that relationship is sort of developed over time, and it's not, and so they become the special uncle. They become the special person in, in her life. And he does give her many things. He's, he's the person that helps her believe she can do certain things that the rest of the family doesn't give her, right? And he see, he chooses her, I think, for that reason, that he knows he can become um, this special person to her. And it isn't until later where, the, where that line is, is crossed. And I think that's co very common um, in stories about sexual trauma and sexual abuse, that, that theme of, of sort of choosing a vulnerable, um, a vulnerable child, a vulnerable girl, a boy, um, who needs somebody special in their life, who needs somebody who's gonna pay special attention to them and being able to provide that for them. And he does provide things for her, and she recognizes that, and I think even later, her ability to sort of um, forgive him or understand, understand him a little bit, or I think that's hard for some people, but I think that it also really says a lot about her healing process and why, um, why she's been able to come to this point to tell the story. Why it's important to her to tell the story. And, and also the uh, going back to the healing process, it, it's not, it's, 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 the, it's the opportunity to say after all of this time, I, this is how I saw it when I was 18, and I saw it wrong in this way. And it's taken me X number of years to say, no, it was wrong on much deeper levels. It was wrong on much, uh, it was much more complicated than how I saw it when I was 11 and 13 and 15 and even 18. So by the time she's 18, she's saying, no, this is wrong. But she's saying it's wrong because we're 
hurting my aunt. We're going against the family. We're, we're violating the, the ethics of, of marriage. Um, whereas when she's 35, she's saying no. Yeah. No, it's, wrong. it, it so was wrong many on, on levels. much, much deeper levels for much, much longer than it was. And, and I think, you know, not to, um, I don't want to rhyme too much away, but um, how I learned, I like how it is, how I learned how to drive. I mean, it, it really foregrounds this, um, this theme of education. Like how do we acquire knowledge? How does she get from the 13-year-old to the, I mean, it is, it's a developmental sort of psychological um, progression, but we also have the beginning where all of her knowledge is gained in the home, right? And her, and you know, I think this is something to think about when you're watching this, is, what, what kind of information does she have about her sexuality at 13, right? And, and I think this play really crit critiques how, 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 how we do acquire knowledge and what we shield from children and how we, how we couch sexuality, and how we um, sort of intergenerationally intergener share knowledge about sexuality in really unhealthy ways. And, you know? sure, and how do we perpetuate negative ideas about sexuality and, and how do we subvert those or challenge those and, and so how there are three generations of, of women in this family and how they talk about sex is very different and how they instill those ideas into to the protagonist is definitely informed by, by, by the action. Well I think it's kind of interesting. I'm a mother of two daughters and you know I thought my whole responsibility you know not whole but the responsibility of being a mother is to raise your children to be able to go out in society and be fully formed and have all the skills and attributes. And But part of our responsibility, and I don't know how well I did it, but you can see in this play, is part of your responsibility is to give them the grounds to discover their sexuality in a protected way where there aren't predators, if you will, the predators aren't there. And so in the play where, you know, at 11 years old, her mother says it's your response, whatever happens is your responsibility. And then the mother has the knowledge and maybe he had a past that we was to others, you know, maybe that's part of his, they know this about this. this she man. feels uncomfortable, right? And yeah, so she's yes. uncomfortable yeah. with it, but instead of having, saying, okay, you know, I know you're in danger and don't flirt with him, but you know, but, Flirting is part of learning how to be sexual, and 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 they, we, there's just not that place in this in this narrative for her to to grow up and all, you know they're teaching her how to cook and so and all this other stuff. But everybody's goal is you're going to get married and have kids, and I'm you know and but not to help them out with the sexuality. But, right, and ultimately the, the mother doesn't protect her. Right, she doesn't protect her. She's like you're on your own, you know, and it's your fault. I um, was talking with one of my colleagues um, about the play and who deals with sexual trauma a lot, and she said that one of the things that is um, most telling of how well a, a victim of sexual trauma will recover or heal is how, how the mom handles it once it's come to life. So, you know, there's, I, I have worked with a lot of women who are adult survivors, and their mothers didn't protect them, or they came from families like this one that's pretty dysfunctional. And so it takes years, I think, to sort of build the skills, build the maturity of understanding um, to be able to handle what they need to understand about this. Whereas I think, you know, when, when if we could turn back time and say at 11 years old, her mother had stepped in perhaps and then gotten help for her right away, which sometimes happens. It can be a non. It can. It can be a, the healing process can be fairly easy, fairly much easier. I don't know if it's ever easy. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I, I think can can we? Uh, how can you access the, the tools to make it easier? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we? How can they? How can they navigate through the healing process in, in a healthy her way? Right. So if a mother steps in and protects, and a mother steps in and says, we're going to get you whatever help you need, we're going to talk about this, we're going to, right? That's very different than, than, what, than what happens in this play. So, you know, kind of paying attention to that relationship um, 
it says it tells a lot if you think about her how long her process ends up being. You know. Yes. I, I thought that her um, comment in regard to um, how we become sexual or how we um, begin to deal with men, she had called it flirting, um, which I guess is as good a term as any, but um, I, I'm thinking about everyone in this room probably got kind of messages from everyone that they were around as to how you deal with men, what men are like, what the roles of men are. And that starts at a very young age, maybe one, two. So it's a very ingrained kind of process. And I think that goes back to the feminist narrative and how, how that's ingrained into us. It's, it's, it's a social structure. It's a social construct, really. It's, and, and so how, how can we change that construction? How can we challenge that? How can we subvert it? How can we rewrite that narrative? And I think How I Learned to Drive is, again, written in 1998, was, is really still trying to do that even after 15 years, is, is saying, we, <laughs> she wrote this 15 years ago, and we're still like, yeah, ah, maybe. Yeah. That's hard, right? Yeah, and um, starting and stopping, stalling out, car metaphors, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, any, what, the other thing that I, 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 I want to bring to the table is um, how we discuss this during the, the actual process of the play. One of the things that we, we started off with is the idea that, that this play is not quote unquote, about uh, pedophilia. Um, a lot of times when I say to, to my students, well, well, what is the story about? They immediately go into plot points and they, they pick out kind of the, 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 big, the big thing that, that sticks out to them, which is great, it's a starting point. But asking, this, asking anybody what is this play about is we have to go to the deeper level and we have to look at uh, messages, themes, ideas. And so when we were talking about this and approaching this as in the production process, the play quickly did not, we moved away from it being about pedophilia and we moved it more into being about overcoming trauma and how do we use narratives to, uh, to, to, to move past it. So one of the things that, that we addressed explicitly is um, how it, it is power, power in that relationship. Who has power when? How is power being fought over in the scenes? Uh, so going down to details of like who is sitting, who is standing, where is little bit standing? Is she in the scene or is she out of the scene? Is she watching the scene as part of a memory or is she an active participant within the scene? So the power structures um, are, are a major part of that in, in trying to help with that healing process. When does she feel comfortable to be a part of the scene? When does she feel that it's more powerful to be outside of the scene and watching, getting out of her own way to let the scene unfold, so to speak. Um, and that power play, again, the fact that it's not just about, that is not just a power feminist, or power girl narrative, or it's not just about a, a victim narrative, right? There's always this kind of shifting of gears, okay? Um, and a lot of that is, you know, also, I think, contingent upon how Uncle, Uncle uh, Peck is uh, represented, right? He's not the big bad wolf in many ways, right? And I think that's hard for us to wrap our head around because when we see in the newspaper, the sensational newspaper child, the pedophile or the, right, child molester, Right, I and mean, that is the big bad wolf, right? And it's it backpedals, right, from that. And it says, hey, let's take a second look at what it means to actually engage in emotional and sexual abuse and to be a perpetrator of that, right? Um, and it's it's really, I think, important, you know, in understanding what it's all about. Um, and it, it, it complicates the narrative of, of How many of you uh, have, have read the play or have already seen our production? Okay. Thanks, Austin. Everybody in the booth is going, we've seen it. Good. Glad you guys are paying attention. That's nice. 
<laughs> so uh, one of the things that, that uh, has come up probably within, well, actually since we opened on Thursday, is, is um, confusion. And this is something that we talked about yesterday in the calendar, but I'd like to open that up to, you mentioned it earlier, about the, how it's, it uh, illustrates relationships in a particular way and it makes the audience go, wait, no, that's not, that's not right. Well, and I think it, it plays off what your point just was. It would be so much easier for all of us if we could just put Uncle Peck in, a, in the box as the evil, bad uncle. So we were all, I think, comfortable with, but it's not like that. And, and, and she's come to understand that it's not like that a little bit. And so I think you're right, it gets, it's gotten all of us talking a lot, which is great, because I think the more that we can talk about some of those subtleties uh, or some of the experiences that people don't know about, or the parts of the relationship that people don't necessarily talk about a lot, that's when I think we, especially, that's when people I think would start to recognize, or a young girl um, would maybe recognize when this is not, when this is off and talk about it, right? And that's what we, that's what we would want. That's, that is sort of how, right? Um, it's not just the stranger danger, right? I mean, even as a young girl, I remember, like in the 80s, that was, it was all about the stranger danger, right? And you know, the, the notion would be that you would be snatched, you know, from you know into a vehicle or something. And that was the only idea. And I knew that that was bad, but I mean, no one. I mean, I, I had no concept of what the subtleties of, of, of a situation like that would be. I mean, you know, and I think. The, Statistic now is over 80% of victims know their perpetrator. You know, so it's more often than not. Yeah. And um, and the, the going back to the text, the, we see moments of, of this this man genuinely, or in his mind, genuinely looking out for her well-being, mm -hmm. giving her life advice, looking out for her safety, giving her encouragement, giving her. Uh, uh, specific 